Hello, I'm Dave DeWitt, your host for Heat Up Your Life. I'm here in Miami for a serious investigation into the economic impact of the fiery foods industry. Cut, cut. What's the matter? It's not you. What? Wardrobe. Hi, I'm Dave DeWitt in my more normal state, and your host for Heat Up Your Life. In our second episode, we're going to show you how chili pepper products are made from beginning to end. It all starts with this and ends with this. of people, peppers, and passion. We dedicate this next hour to Heat Up Your Life. And now, episode two, From Seed to Salsa. Okay, here we go, here we go. We're on a fiery quest. We've come to sunny Florida to interview the manufacturers of hot and spicy products and to discover what motivates these people to stay in the rather unusual industry of fiery foods. But we have another mission as well. We've heard tales that somewhere in the wilds of Florida, there is a shrine to chili peppers so emotionally moving that adults have fallen to their knees in abject worship. Join us as we search this vast chili-shaped state for the shrine that is the holy grail to chili heads. We'll return to the Florida Quest in a moment. But first, let's take a look at the early process of growing chili peppers. Of course, many chili heads create their own shrine to chilies in the form of a pepper garden. They grow with such passionate devotion because they can't find the varieties they need for cooking in the markets. I'm so devoted that I winter over my chilies in the greenhouse so I'll always have a supply of fresh pods. But the main use of my greenhouse is for starting chili plants from seed. Since most nurseries have limited varieties of chili seedlings for sale, chili head gardeners are forced to buy or trade for exotic seed. In the dead of winter, I search seed catalogs to find new varieties that I'd never grown before. Often, most of my seed comes from collectors who offer their unusual varieties through listings in the Seed Savers Exchange yearbook. This year, in addition to the New Mexican varieties that I'll roast, peel, and freeze, I've selected New Mex Centennial, Serrano, Abanero, Cayenne, Bulgarian Carrot, Lemon Drop Ahi, Chinese Yellow Emperor, and Bonnie Peppers from Barbados. After selecting the seeds, I prepare the plastic grow cells by filling them up with a mix of potting soil, perlite, and vermiculite. I wet the mixture and place two seeds in each cell. Each variety is carefully labeled with a tag and recorded in a log. The cells are placed in trays and the trays positioned on heating coils for quicker germination. At any time during the winter or spring, prepare the garden site. First, always add organic material such as aged manure or compost. Manure is particularly important because it is also your natural fertilizer. Next is the mixing of the organic material into the soil. I need the exercise, so I use a shovel to loosen the garden, but feel free to use a rototiller. Finally, with the shovel, I form the plot into rows and furrows for irrigating in the dry climate of New Mexico. The pepper garden is now ready for the plants. Meanwhile, our search for hot stuff in Florida began in Miami, which is the gateway to the Caribbean. At the busy Miami International Airport, flights land every few minutes from numerous island nations, and some of those flights carry chili peppers, as we found out at PFM International Corporation, a major importer. There we met with CEO Kathy Hawkins, who explained the importing procedure. That's a complicated procedure. The first thing that happens is, of course, the airplane lands. It gets cleared through customs as a whole, and they bring the cargo over to their facility. And the first thing that has to happen is the peppers have to be checked by the USDA, Plant right. Protection and Quarantine. And what they're looking for is insects. If they find an insect in your peppers or any produce that you're trying to clear, they'll take that insect and put it in a little jar, send it over to the lab, and the lab will determine whether that insect is a garden variety, common, everyday insect, or whether it's something that's harmful to the U.S. environment. If it's harmful, then two things can happen. Depending upon what it is, they'll either make you fumigate your produce, or they'll make you return it to the point of origin, or they'll make you destroy it. And that's all done at your expense. On a random basis, you'll have the FDA 
um, say that they want to inspect your produce and what they're looking for is uh, fertilizers or pesticides that are not allowed into the United States. If it's not clean, then you have a real problem because that shipper will never be able to ship product, this product in the United States again until he goes through a huge series of hurdles. I mean, it's a long process. He can do it, but it's something you just do not want to happen. So all of my growers are very well aware of the fertilizers and pesticides that are allowed by the FDA to be used in this country because once you do it, it's a kiss of death. <laughs> you do not want that to happen. So once all of those hurdles are cleared, then you're free to distribute your, your produce to wherever it's going. After the peppers clear customs, USDA, and the FDA, they are carefully sorted to make certain that only the best pods are shipped to the fresh market. Less than perfect pods are dried and flaked, or they are ground into red habanero mash for use in making Caribbean-style hot sauces. Kathy, we've heard rumors about some sort of shrine to chili peppers, like the holy grail of chili peppers here in Florida. Could you give us a hint about where we might find this shrine? Well, go see the Germans, Dave. Thanks. The clue from Kathy Hawkins led me not to Germany, but all the way across the state to St. Petersburg, which I soon found out should be called St. Peppersburg. I had heard tales of a German-owned hot shop on a pier, so I found my way to the St. Petersburg Pier and found a convenient trolley to take me to the far end of the dock. Could a hot shop be the sacred chili shrine? I didn't think so, but I'd have to cross-examine the Germans. Well, I heard about you folks. Uh, I was told to track down the Germans in St. Petersburg, and I think uh, that maybe I have. So tell me about your operation. Uh, you came from Germany, I hear. Yes, we did. It was chilly in Germany, but not <laughs> our idea of chili. So uh, <laughs> we wrote the Chili Pepper Buch, the first ah. comprehensive German book about the subject, but that was not chilly enough, so we moved to Florida. And you're both manufacturers and retailers. We run Suncoast Peppers with its own line of award-winning hot sauces and uh -huh. Peppers on the Pier, our little shop of horrors. And what is your best-selling hot sauce in this shop? Since eight out of 10 people ask for the hottest, um, we have our own hottest non-extract sauce, which is the Liquid Axe, and of course- So that's all natural then, That's huh? all natural. That's only habanero peppers and fresh ginger root, and the pungency of the ginger adds to the heat. And of course, the extract sauces, as you can see up there, the Widow, Dave's Insanity, these are the extract sauces that uh, always sell real well. Since you're here in Florida, maybe you know something about what I've been hearing about a, a shrine to chili peppers or something like this here in Florida? I think uh, the best bet down here would be if you saw the uh, Boborosa Gourmet Place. They make hot sauce, they make all kinds of fire foods. So can you take me to this Boborosa Place? Absolutely. Okay, well, I'll follow you. A Barbarossa turned out to be the manufacturing company of the husband and wife team of Bob and Rosa, sometimes called Cindy, Martin. <laughs> Things were getting very confusing on the trail of the chili shrine. I caught them in Clearwater in the act of hand labeling some bottles of Florida heat hot sauce. Now, is this one of these super hot sauces I've been hearing so much about? No, sir. This is uh, one that's made with uh, Florida produce. It has a sunshine full of flavor. Aha, so it's not gonna kill me if I, if I try some of this. No, sir. Well, you know, I've been sent here to ask you a very important question. I've been hearing all these rumors about some sort of a chili shrine here in Florida, but I have no idea where it is. Can you give me a hint? Well, you know, I've heard about it, but i tell you who you can go see. Who's that? Uh, Ruskin Rednecks. The Rednecks? Well, we'll just go see the Rednecks. But first, back to Albuquerque and my pepper garden. The next step in the garden, after the final frost of the spring, is to transplant the seedlings into the garden plot. I dig small holes in the garden, spacing the seedlings about a foot and a half apart. Then the seedlings are placed in the hole, tagged with their code number, and watered thoroughly. Then I mulch the seedlings with newspaper weighted down with soil to keep it in place. Other pepper gardeners mulch with plastic film or grass clippings. 
My home garden practices are quite a bit different from commercial chili growers, at least in scale. And there's no better place to see mass transplanting than at the famous McElhenney Farm at Avery Island, Louisiana, home of the renowned Tabasco sauce. Here the Tabasco peppers are being placed in fields where they've been grown, rotating with other crops, for more than 125 years by the McElhenney Company. But the purpose of transplanting these seedlings is not specifically to make Tabasco sauce. The pods will furnish pure seed for the McElhenney growing operations in Central and South America. There, the Tabasco peppers will be harvested, made into mash, and returned to Avery Island for the final processing into the famous sauce. During the summer months, approximately 125,000 acres of peppers of all varieties are grown by farmers in the United States. While we don't know the acreage for home gardeners, they face the same challenges. In order to survive, chilies have a few basic wants and needs. Watering. Regular and measured watering is best. And remember that overwatering can lead to fungal diseases on the roots. Fertilizer. If you use manure in the plot, as we suggested earlier, it is unlikely that chilies will need further fertilization. Weeding. Even with mulch, those evil weeds will somehow find a way to grow. Always pull them immediately. Never use herbicides. Pest control. Use organic techniques when possible, like netting over the chilies to keep off pests. Hot pepper wax containing capsaicin is a natural insecticide for aphids and white fly. So, barring a hailstorm, extremely high winds, a virus infection, or chili-loving rabbits, your plants should look like these. Far from the pepper fields of North America, the chili growers of Jamaica plant their crops to a different tune. In this exotic, timeless land of mento music and reggae, aqua blue waters and engaging stiltmen. It's Jack is in the beanstalk. And you? Jack in the beanstalk still, man. And Jack in the bush. Yeah. Yeah. Jamaica, no problem. We discovered an amazing 10 year old, 12 foot high chili plant. Well, if anybody doubted that uh, chili peppers are a perennial plant, there'll be no doubt here because I'm standing in front of a gigantic plant here by the, uh, the great house and this is called an old lady's pepper. It's, it's not the same thing as a scotch bonnet. As a matter of fact, it's not even the same species. This is a uh, capsicum annuum and uh, you can see it's a fairly small pod and so forth, but uh, the way to really tell whether this is related to the scotch bonnet is to open it up and taste it. And that's what we're going to do. No, it does not have the Scotch Bonnet aroma at all. It's a completely different aroma, and let's see what it tastes like. It's hot, but it's not as flavorful as a Scotch Bonnet. An old lady's pepper is what they call that. No offense. The Scotch Bonnet, the same species as the recently popular habanero, is the chili of choice in Jamaica and much of the Caribbean. However, as our guide David Brown pointed out, there are many different Jamaican chilies. We call these kitchen peppers. Okay. And right away you can see it's growing near the kitchen. Right. <laughs> All right. Makes and the, sense. the reason why they call it kitchen pepper is that you will get, it will grow elsewhere in the garden, but it will never bear and do as well as near the kitchen. And in most cases, you didn't plant it, it just grew up by itself. So our old folks feel that it's a smoke from the wood fire because in those days, most people cook with wood fire. Right. And they claim it's the smoke from the kitchen that makes it do so well. And so you push your hand right through the kitchen window and pick a pepper when you're cooking. <laughs> How handy, that's K great. Kitchen pepper. As in Jamaica, there is a long time chili pepper tradition in Louisiana. Well, we're here in the uh, Tabasco fields on Avery Island with uh, Paul McElhenney, and uh, these are beautiful. These plants are great. I, I just uh, feel like I'm in heaven. <laughs> they are. They're doing well. We've had a good bit of rain, and they're just thriving. And so um, uh, tell us the purpose of maintaining the fields on Avery Island. Well, we used to grow all of our pepper here, and we'd like to, but uh, we really, the, available, the pool of uh, labor to pick them has kind of dried up, so we we go to Latin America. This is a seed. We grow about 50 acres of pepper here on the island, and uh, we grow them for to produce all of our seed. We do produce some pepper mash for product, 
But we keep this farm also as an experimental farm to make sure that our cultivational practices and knowledge of farming on peppers is as up-to-date as it should be. I see. And so uh, is the seed from uh, these plants then transferred to Latin America so that the, the growers maintain a, a, a uniform kind of crop? Exactly. We, we process the seed here, we dry it, we treat it with an antifungal uh, powder and we uh, cryovac it and then we send it there. We also put uh, I think about 50 pounds in uh, the bank vault in New Iberia <laughs> as, a, as a protection against total disaster. Well, I, I know that uh, you're famous for your Tabascos and so forth, but uh, you're getting interested in a lot of other peppers now, right? Oh, yeah. We've, we've got the jalapeno sauce. We're working on a habanero pepper sauce. We have a, a cayenne uh, blended pepper garlic hot sauce. We have all sorts of peppers we're working on besides the capsicum frutescens or the Tabasco right. variety. Uh, with this, uh, the boom in hot and spicy foods that's gone on uh, in this country, uh, we've seen a lot of imitators of, of your kind of product in terms of not necessarily the Tabasco, but other pepper sauces and so forth. How are all these competitors uh, affecting, say, your market position with uh, Tabasco? Well, surprisingly enough, uh, you would have thought our, our market share has eroded, but it really has, has actually only a fraction, but it actually grew the last couple of years. But the whole industry is growing. Uh, the interesting and fun thing for us is that our market share is, is holding. Tell me about your theory of why hot and spicy foods have become so popular in the last 20 years. Well, it's, a, I think, a whole bunch of things. Uh, Mexican-American food, uh, soul food, Cajun Creole food, southwestern chili craze. Uh, all of those have taught people how to use chilies, how to use pepper sauces, how to use salsas, and have gotten people to kind of lose their fear. I really think that nachos and, and salsa, picante sauce and salsa, uh, where kids will just eat a lot of it, either in the Mexican restaurant or at home, has educated them about peppers, and it's just been a great boon to us all. There's something warm and fuzzy about chili peppers that people can't resist. They love to touch them, toss them, run their fingers through them, well, fondle them. Warning. Chili heads who compulsively engage in this behavior should avoid touching sensitive body parts. But now, back to Florida. I had been given the assignment of tracking down the rednecks, which meant a trip back across the impressive Skyway Bridge to end up in the tiny town known as Ruskin. Finding the rednecks was easy, considering the large sign on the side of their building. But I was in for a surprise. I was looking for the rednecks. Where'd you found Really? Well, you know, you don't look much like a redneck to me. Now, what are rednecks supposed to look like? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you're redefining the term redneck. Amen to that. We <laughs> are redefining the term redneck. Well, why don't we go inside and talk about it? We could do that. <laughs> so, uh, about how many uh, rednecks are there in Ruskin, anyway? Oh, probably a whole cubby. Oh, I see. <laughs> this, this must be the laundry center for Ruskin. No, here. actually, that's our that's our cooler. Oh, that's your cooler. Yeah. Okay. So, Anne, how do you define redneck these days? Well, we uh, we read in our dictionary where rednecks were mostly poor, mostly white, mostly southern, and that we were violent, ignorant, and bigoted. Uh oh. Well. That got our hackles up, so we decided to redefine redneck, and that's what we've done. So we're we're the new kind of redneck. New we're kind of rednecks. The kinder, gentler redneck. Nouveau redneck. No, well, maybe yeah, <laughs> nouveau rednecks. We're going back to how redneck was started, why why how it got its name because of people who worked hard to take care of their families. They believed in God. They believed in country. Right. They they were kind. They helped their neighbors. And that's what a redneck's all about. And they make hot sauce. And they make hot sauce. So, Sandy, tell me a little bit about your products. Okay, we have uh, several different hot sauces. Um, Sweat Thing is our hottest. Uh -huh. And this one won first place in New Orleans in one of the national competitions. Uh -huh. And have Sweet Thing, made out of uh, mango with habanero. And we have Sissy Thing, for those who don't like it quite so hot. And then we have Tangy Thing, with more of our garlicky flavor. Uh, Dave. When we redefine the term redneck, we also are the international headquarters for the American Redneck Society. Oh, I see. So when we heard you were coming, we wanted to make you an honorary member of the American Redneck Society. I'm touched and honored. Well, 
we're, we're happy to have you, but there's some obligation that comes with it. Here is your certificate of membership. Oh, Here's your certificate of membership. All right. Welcome to the American Redneck Society. Now, here is a copy of your Redneck Creek. Oh, I see. Now, in order to be a member of the American Redneck Society, you have to promise a couple of things. So if you'd raise, raise your hand. Please. Okay. You promise by all that's holy. I promise that, by all that's holy. That's right. That you will abide by the Redneck Creed. That I will abide by the Redneck Creed. Amen. Amen. Give me five. <laughs> you are a proud member. Well, that's your bumpers. Oh, thank you very much. Now, Ruskin Redneck folks, um, I've heard that in Florida somewhere there's this shrine to chili peppers where people actually worship. Could you give me some hint of where I could go to find this place? Go see the widow. To find the widow, I had to go back across the magnificent Skyway Bridge again and return to the St. Petersburg Pier, where I discovered that the widow was not a person, but rather an extremely potent sauce. We're here on the St. Petersburg Pier with uh, Bryn Ankrum, who's the manufacturer of this particular sauce that's called Widow. And Bryn, my question for you is, why would you call a sauce Widow instead of calling it like Bryn's Hot Sauce or something like that? <laughs> well, uh, as my uh, wife would probably point out, it's unlikely that the market would swarm to Bryn's Hot Sauce. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, uh, we want a label and a name that uh, sort of indicates what might be in that bottle, some idea of how it might perform. Like deadly. Like deadly, yes, <laughs> okay. exactly. So what makes this sauce so deadly? Well, this is a, a first time for my company to combine uh, a new product, which is a water-soluble oleoresin, which is important because it mixes well with water-soluble other organic uh, parts, such as Caribbean red habaneros that we use as a base for this product. But it's a one million unit water soluble capsaicin, and when added to the already pungent pods, gives us an extreme burn. How's this doing? Is it uh, selling well for you? Uh, we have been uh, extremely pleased. We sold out of it at the Florida Fiery Food Show in October when it was introduced. So you glue this little spider onto the uh, onto the jar for promotional purposes, yeah. I guess. Yeah, and that was kind of funny because uh, when I originally found this spider, uh, I assumed I could get more and had to go all the way through an oriental trading company to, <laughs> to, to get 28,000 spiders at a time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to ask you sort of a funny question. Uh, we're here in Florida and we keep hearing rumors of some sort of shrine to uh, chili peppers. Uh, do you yeah. have any idea of where we could go to find this shrine? Oh, that's really supposed to be a state-held secret. Oh. Um, however, uh, probably a good place to start would be over in West Palm Beach. Uh, Charlie Chandlemeyer. And he makes this stuff, doesn't he? Well, Charlie is my packer. Yeah, yeah, he makes all my products over there, and uh, it's 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 an interesting event to observe, actually. As it turns out, well, you'll see when you get there. Okay, well, we'll go see him. Thanks, Brent. All right. Interesting is hardly the word to describe what we encountered at Sauce Crafters in West Palm Beach. Scary would be a better term. When you work with one million Scoville unit oleoresin to make a super hot sauce, you'd better be careful. The widow sauce is poured into the bottling machine and carefully hand bottled. Once the widow is in the jar, it is safety sealed, labeled, and then it's time for all the spiders. After witnessing the spectacle of making the widow, I asked Charlie the most important question. Charlie, we're looking for a chili pepper shrine of some sort here in Florida. Could you give us any hints on where we could find this shrine? Go see Tahiti Joe, Dave. Tahiti Joe. Thanks, Charlie. But before we look for Tahiti Joe, it's time to check out my own personal pepper harvest. You know, this is one of my favorite times of the year because after working for months and months and months in your garden, the chilies are finally ripe and ready to be picked. And I've picked five of my favorite chilies that I grew this year, and here they are. First, 
a very, very wonderful ornamental chili. This is New Mex Centennial, and one of the reasons I like this particular chili is because it has multicolored pods on the plant for nearly the entire summer. And you can use these to do edging, to do borders. They make a very, very vivid display of chilies. They're also edible. You can use these just like a chili piquin. Next, if you like salsas, boy, I tell you, it's hard to beat a Serrano chili for making a really good pico de gallo salsa. These come in both green and red. They mature to red. The reds have a lot more sugar in them than the greens, so the flavor comes out a little bit more, and you combine these with chopped tomatoes and onions, a little cilantro, some vinegar. Boy, you've got a wonderful pico de gallo salsa. Next, the hottest chili in the world. We grew some of these. These are the orange habaneros from the Yucatan Peninsula. And I tell you, they may be hot, but you can tone them down when you make a hot sauce because you can use a fruit or a vegetable base to dilute the extreme heat of the habaneros. Now, these have a wonderful fruity aroma, too, and that's uh, one of their distinguishing characteristics. Now, for people who like Cajun food, boy, it's hard to beat a cayenne chili. Look at this beautiful red cayenne. And you can use this to make a hot sauce, too, Louisiana style, or or you can chop it up and use it in Cajun and Creole dishes. Now, I would be remiss living in New Mexico if I didn't grow some New Mexican chilies, and I did. And this is one of my favorites. This is one of the largest chilies in the world. This is the New Mex Big Jim. Now, this is not the longest one that I've ever seen. This is about eight or nine inches long. I've seen them as long as 14 inches, and you roast them and peel them and then stuff them to make chilies rellenos. At the same time we hobbyists are harvesting our bountiful crops in home gardens, the commercial growers are busy too. From August to November, pickers in the fields of southern New Mexico harvest first the green chilies and then the red later in the year. Some red chili is machine harvested, but all the green chili must be hand-picked to avoid damaging the tender pods. From the handheld buckets, the chilies are transferred to large wooden bins that can be handled by machinery. The bins are loaded onto trucks for transportation to processing plants, where they will be washed and then either processed or transferred to produce wholesalers selling to the fresh market. New Mexican chilies are sold fresh, dried, canned, frozen, powdered, and manufactured into hundreds of products. More than a thousand miles south of New Mexico, it seems like it's always chili harvest time at La Merced, the huge open-air mercado in Mexico City. We explored the market with chili expert Jose Marmolejo. And I'll look, we have some uh, red jalapenos, but I understand they're not really called jalapenos in Mexico City, right? That's right, Dave. You know, here in Mexico City, what we know as jalapenos, they know them as cuaresmeños. Cuaresmeños has something to do with Lent and the Lenten season? Right. Uh, Cuaresma is a word for Lent, so apparently they use them during Lent, and uh, that's why they got the name. Why are all these different names for the chilies? Everybody, every region has a different name for their own chilies, and it gets confusing. <laughs> and these are called chilies de arbol because they, they grow tall like a tree, hence the name arbol. That's correct. correct. And right over here, we have some green uh, versions of the same uh, chilies de arbol, right? Yes, that's it is. It is, it is very rare to find chile de arbol in the green and in the red mature form. We only know them in the United States in the dried form. And look down here, look at the size of these uh, cuaresmeños, I guess, we, right. <laughs> or jalapenos. Some of them nearly four inches long. That's yes. remarkable. La Merced Market has an absolute wealth of chilies with dozens of varieties from every region in Mexico at very reasonable prices. The familiar chilies are all here, like the poblanos, which when dried are called anchos. Together, they are probably the most popular chilies used in cooking in Mexico. The more exotic chilies are the canarios, which were transferred from the Andes of South America and are grown in the mountainous regions of Mexico. Another exotic chili is the chipotle, a smoked chili, but as Jose explains, the terminology of the different types of chipotles like moras and moritas can be very confusing. All smoked chiles are chipotles, chili being chili and pocli being smoke. smoke. So all moras, moritas are all chipotles. The difference is some are serranos, some are jalapenos, some come from Veracruz, some come from Puebla, some come from Chiapas. Therefore, they got different uh, varieties of chili and a different wood to smoke them. That's why we have all this spectrum of aromas. Okay, let's uh, smell one here. This is a mora. That's a mora. Smoked jalapeno. Yeah, very nice. Sometimes the eating of peppers comes in hidden form. This is Resolex, the paprika oleoresin extraction facility in Radium Springs, New Mexico. Here the oleoresin, the oil containing red pigment, 
is extracted from the non-pungent paprika. First, locally grown pods are crushed and the seeds separated out for later planting. The crushed pods are pelletized and the pellets are transferred to the tower where they are treated with a solvent hexane, which dissolves out the oils. To make a complicated story short, the hexane is evaporated off for future use and the spent paprika pellets are loaded up and sold as cattle feed. The resulting oil is transferred from the tower to the packaging room while samples are analyzed in the Resolex laboratory to make sure it meets customer specifications. We spoke with Resolex owner Lou Bayad. Tell me about some of the uses of this uh, oleoresin paprika that you produce here. People use it all the time. They're not aware of it because it's a very subtle thing. But it's used in pepperoni, a lot of meat uh, products like bologna, uh, sausage, uh, as animal feed for poultry, uh, for seasonings and salad dressings, soups, uh, mayonnaise, number, a whole broad range. Does it add any flavor to these products or just color? It's mostly, it's practically all for coloring. The flavor is so diluted that it's almost uh, non-detectable. What would these meats look like without the oleoresin paprika? They wouldn't be very palatable. They'd look pale and, and gray and very uh, unpleasant, especially the, bol the bologna. Is oleoresin paprika the number one food coloring now? Oh, well, it is as far as natural food color. Yes. You know, there are many dyes, artificial colors out on the market, but there's a lot of concern about the health hazard of that. So as a natural red food color, oleoresin paprika is number one. The Resolex plant was fascinating, but it couldn't really be called a shrine to chilies. My latest mission on the search for the chili pepper shrine was to find Tahiti in Florida. Tahiti Joe, that is. I thought that the people in the fiery foods industry certainly had wacky names for themselves as well as their products. But then, Florida was not exactly normal. I'd probably find the shrine in the sunken monkey jungle parrot garden, or one of the other state attractions like Rodent World. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Good to see you. How you doing? OK. You know, this may be Florida, but it looks like Tahiti to me. That's right. My bihini wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> OK. Go ahead and take a seat. Thanks. So, Joe, uh, tell me about making Polynesian sauces in Florida. Well, I find it exciting. Uh, it's got the heat that people are looking for, but with the flavor and the honey and the clam juice that I use for our tropical blend, it just turns out delicious. Apparently, uh, a lot of people like it because all my sauces have won all major awards. Oh, oh, this is my wife, Charlotte. Most people call her Mrs. Tahiti Joe. Hi, Hello. Mrs. Tahiti Joe. You're the one who made the cookie. I certainly am. Oh, my gosh. Can I try one of these cookies? Of course. Go right ahead. Now, this is the cookie that was entered into the SCOBY competition, the SCOBY Awards for the best hot and spicy products, and it beat out 400 other products. So I've got to try one of these uh, Mrs. Tahiti Joe's hot chipanero cookies. I see why it won. This is fantastic. So Joe, while we're down here in Florida, we're looking for some kind of chili pepper shrine or something. Could, could you help us out? Well, all your best bet is uh, go over down to the swamp and you gotta talk to the gator people. The gator people? Yes. Oh, great. Now I had to drive to the Everglades and find some gator people. It would be just my luck to find the shrine in the middle of the swamp guarded by a rabid pack of alligators. Forging ahead, I tromped through the swamps of South Florida, not knowing if danger lay ahead. Hey, I'm looking for a buddy at Gator Hammock. Well, hop on board and we'll go find him. OK, thanks. <clears throat> Fortunately, I ran into Jimmy, an expert airboat captain who vowed to deliver me safely to my remote destination not content to sit idle. I scanned the dense horizon for clues to the elusive chili pepper shrine. Awesome scenery. And nervous neighbors. We soon reached my destination, Gator Hammock, where Buddy Taylor awaits my arrival. Perhaps the quest for the chili shrine will end here in the swamp. Are you Buddy? Yeah, I am. 
Good to meet you. I'm Dave DeWitt. Oh, hi. I've been looking all over the swamps for you. They said to go to the gator hammock place, and I was just wondering, how do you get the gators up in the hammocks? <laughs> oh, man. It ain't that kind of hammock. Uh, the gator hammock is a uh, name just put together with the gators, and the hammock is a group of trees, we call it down here in the south. Sort of like a rise in the swamp. Exactly. And you named your sauce that, right? I did. And what about your sauce here, uh, this gator sauce? Uh, does this have any gator parts in it? No, nah, there's no gator. No gator. <laughs> that's just in the name. That's just our okay. good old logo. We're gator fans, and there's gators where I live, so that's kind of where the gator hammock come from. I got to tell you, buddy, uh, I've been told that there's a shrine to chili peppers somewhere here in Florida, and I was sent to you to try to help me find it. Got any ideas? Oh, yeah, you got to go to Key West. Key West? Uh, where in Key West? Just go to Key West. Just go to Key West and I'll find it. You'll find it. You cannot miss it. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. But before making the journey to Key West, we took some side trips to learn about other methods of processing chilies. The state of Oaxaca has the largest number of rare and unusual cultivated chilies in the country. More than 60 varieties are grown only in Oaxaca and nowhere else in Mexico. To find these chilies, all we had to do was visit the Mercado. There, we spoke with chili vendor Eliseo Ramirez, and again, Jose Marmolejo assisted in helping us to understand these interesting chilies and their culinary usage. Over here, we have some very unusual chilies that are found nowhere else in the, in the world. These are Pasilla de Oaxaca. Pasilla de Oaxaca, estos son para rellenar. Uh, but uh, and vinagre, como le llaman, or salsas comunes. Okay, I can understand that. He's talking to us, they're stuffed, right? Right, they're used uh, mainly the big ones for stuffing. Uh, you can make a salsa or you can have them pickled in a scabbage. Oh, I see. Okay, these uh, chihuahuas here, I'm growing some of these in my garden in Albuquerque. Uh, some seeds brought back by my friend Jim Payton from this very market. But wow. uh, ask him what they're used for. I guess they're used for the black moles. Mole That's correct. El chihuacle negro es para el mole negro. Exclusivamente para mole negro, para otras comidas como ese chichilo. Y, y otros guisos que uh, es, main, en Oaxaca se usa. Mainly for the mole negro, but there's also uh, one of the seven moles called chichilo also calls for it. Oh, okay. These uh, these bright red chilies here, the onza, is that uh, how you how you say it? Chili onza. Mm -hmm. What is it? Chili de onza is exclusivamente nada más para salsas. Para salsas. Okay, it's it's used exclusively in salsas, correct? You got it. <laughs> I'm understanding this better and better the more we uh, <laughs> go to these markets. I'm starting to get it. What about this chihuacle amarillo? Again, one of the seven molas. Uh, the amarillo calls for both the chihuacle amarillo and the amarillo. Would you ask uh, Eliseo why he got so interested in, in selling chilies? Well, he used to sell uh, perishables, tomatoes and lettuce and the like, and he was not uh, he was not happy. Uh, seeing all these vegetables going bad, so he decided to go into the dry stuff that lasts longer. Very and he's smart. been very <laughs> successful, yes. Well, he has a lot of chilies here. Gracias. At the market in Oaxaca, you can have your mole paste custom ground. The selected dried chilies are rehydrated and combined with roasted tomatoes and as many as 20 different herbs and spices. Then, a trip to the Molinero. A molinero is someone who uses a molino or mill to grind either mole paste or chocolate from the beans. The ingredients are placed in the top of the molino and ground to the desired consistency. In some markets, thicker, slightly dehydrated mole pastes are packaged and sold. The mole pastes are used to make thick stews with meats and spices. Oaxaca is famous for its seven uniquely different moles. In both Mexico and the United States, chilies that are harvested fresh must be processed to have the tough outer skin removed. The quickest and easiest way to do that in New Mexico is to visit a professional chili roaster. Ten-year-old Tim Sickler, perhaps the youngest pro chili roaster in the country, took care of us. So, Tim. How long have you been uh, roasting chilies? This is my third year. Your third year, and you make some money at this? I sure do. And what are you going to use that money for? Well, I'm planning to buy a horse. Buy a horse? Yes. Horses don't eat chili. No, not that I think of. <laughs> OK. Well, I'll tell you what, let's fire up these chilies. All right. Tim then opens the drum and pours the green chili pods into it. The drum is slowly turned over propane gas jets so that the chilies are roasted on each side evenly. The point here is not to let the chili burn to a crisp, but to blister the pods enough so that the skin separates from the flesh. 
The blistered chilies are turned out into plastic bags for transport. Be sure to remove them from the bag as soon as possible and peel them quickly to avoid bacterial growth. Thanks a lot, Tim. See you next year. Bye. Bye. Any fresh green chilies can also be roasted and peeled at home without a professional chili roaster. Simply use your outdoor grill or oven roaster to blister the chilies, turning often. When they are completely blistered, remove them from the grill and place in a plastic bag. After letting the chili steam for a few minutes, peel off the skin, remove the seeds, and chop the chili. Place the chili in plastic ice cube trays and freeze. After the cubes are frozen, place them in resealable bags and you have a convenient source of whatever amount of green chili that you need, even a single cube, instead of an iceberg of green chili to hack apart. Before the days of freezers, green chili was preserved differently. It was still roasted and peeled, but then dried. Here at the Romero Farm in Ancon, north of Española in northern New Mexico, the traditional methods are still used to make what is called chili pasado, or chili of the past. The green chili grown on the farm is expected to last for a year, so hundreds of pounds must be processed. After roasting and peeling, the flesh of the pod is placed in an orno, or outdoor oven, for drying. Another method is to dry the chili on screens in the warm fall sun. After drying, the chili pasado can be stored in a glass jar indefinitely. But most people dry their chili in the red form, and across New Mexico, they do it in many innovative ways. Some, like the Chili Express here in Hatch, dry it on their roof. This farmer conveniently leaves his red chili harvest in these flatbed trailers. Others fashion drying racks from all kinds of materials, like this one made from PVC pipe. A more traditional way to preserve red chilies is simply to tie them into strings or ristras. Originally, the pods would be pulled off the ristras as needed in the kitchen, but these days the ristras are as much of a house decoration as a culinary supply. We dropped in on the Ristraman in Mesilla in southern New Mexico. When there's chili drying on their roof, you know the place is authentic. Owner Chris Alexander told us about his fiery enterprise. Well, uh, how many acres do you have in, the, in this field? Well, right here we have six acres of uh, chili with all different varieties uh, planted in here that we use to string our ristras with. I see, this is like right in downtown Mesilla. <laughs> this is right in the historical core of old Mesilla. This is the last agricultural uh, field that's in the historical core of Mesilla. Amazing. Uh, so Chris, this is uh, your crew here making ristras. Why don't you uh, sort of describe to us uh, how they're doing it? Well, first of all, we take and make all our ristras using uh, a baling uh, twine, and uh, we double tie it. We add three pieces of chili in between two lines and uh, position the chili so that it'll be in its uh, proper laying position. And then we uh, take a lighter weight uh, cord and we tie the top of it down. And we find by uh, placing the chili in between the cords and securing it with a knot on top, this uh, helps the ristra from falling apart. How long does it take somebody to make one of these ristras, say that's uh, four feet long? A four foot ristra takes approximately 20 minutes to build or to string, and uh, it's a rather tedious uh, type of work, but uh, it's uh, got its benefits in the way that uh, we're able to create a ristra to reflect the different colors. Well, most ristras you see are the dark red kind, but you've got some orange ones and some yellow ones. I see, well, what, what are these? That's a sunrise uh, chili. That's a new type of pepper, and it's uh, a very popular in the different ristras that we make. It dries to a translucent gold tone. Oh. And uh, this has been on the market probably two years, and uh, so we're one of the very first to have this in this type of a ristra. Chris told us that he was so busy making ristras that he had never tracked how many he sold each year, but it was a lot. He said that he was particularly proud of his chili ristra operation in Mesilla because it preserved his own heritage. Our family heritage uh, dates back to eight generations, approximately 400 years in old Mesilla. And uh, my mother's family were some of the very first to ever inhabit this area along with the conquistadors when they came into the uh, country. Well, my family heritage in New Mexico only goes back 25 years, but they've been hot ones.
You know, making chili powders is a pretty simple procedure. What you need is a spice mill like this one or a coffee grinder dedicated to chilies or you're going to have some pretty hot coffee. And of course, you need chilies. Virtually any variety of chili can be used as long as it's dry enough and will snap like this. That'll make a good powder. Now, if the chili is pliable like this ancho, just put it in a 200 degree oven until it does snap like this and you'll make great powders. Now, of course, when you make these powders, you're going to be creating chili fumes. The fumes can cause you to sneeze inside. Recently, I once sneezed 50 times in a row, so I like to use a little protection. Another important chili processing technique is the making of pepper mash, the basic ingredient of many chili products. Fresh cayenne chilies arrive at the Cervantes Enterprises plant in Vado, New Mexico. The pods are shoveled out of trucks and onto conveyor belts where workers sort them and remove any damaged ones. The pods are then washed to remove debris and dirt from the harvesting operation. They are transferred to a hammer mill where they are ground into a thick liquid. This is the mash. Salt is added as a preservative and the mash is pumped into storage tanks. New Mexico cayenne mash is then transferred by tanker truck to Louisiana, where it is further processed into the famous Louisiana hot sauce. Back on Avery Island, working with a different kind of pepper mash is a way of life. And the method used for Tabasco mash is basically the same one invented by Paul McElhenney's great-grandfather, Edmund. Okay, Paul, what's going on here? This is the aged pepper mash. Mm -hmm. uh, we checked this for color and aroma. If it weren't quite so hot, I might taste it too. Yeah. But this is before it's mixed with vinegar, which extracts the color, the heat, and the aroma from the pepper. It certainly is pungent. The oh, fumes yeah. just come right at you. Exactly. And, and this is aged for three years in, in the barrels. And then we mix it slowly for about 28 days with very strong vinegar, 100 grain vinegar. And then we extract the seeds and the skins. Uh, so Tabasco is different from a lot of other products because we don't grind up the seeds and skins. You don't cook it either. Don't cook it. Don't, don't use, use it very strong vinegar. But don't add any colorings or, or stabilizers. What we do, Dave, is, is the day the peppers are harvested, and of course it's just the bright red, ripest, reddest, right. juiciest peppers, we, we grind them up with about 8% salt, really Avery Island salt coarse ground salt and that mash then actively ferments or works for about 30 to 60 days. It's not a fermentation like in the production of alcohol, but it is a fermentation. And then the mash stays in the barrels for three years. So we bring all of the mash here to Avery Island and finish the aging here. Uh, then after the aging, we clean off the oxidized mash from the top. We drain off the brine and we inspect each barrel and then we uh, slowly mix the aged mash with 100 grain vinegar. So tell me how you uh, manufacture the Tabasco sauce. Well, we take the aged, drain, inspected mash, which is what this is here. We add uh, very strong 100 grain vinegar, mix it slowly for four weeks, and then extract or strain off the seeds and the skins. So uh, how many peppers do you think went into that uh, one scoop there? Well, an awful lot, a lot more than you think. Uh, it takes a lot of peppers to make, because we take the seeds and the skins out, which is a big part of the bulk, so it takes a lot of peppers to make a, a two-ounce bottle of Tabasco sauce. Really? I think, I think Grand Père would be doing triple backflips right now, knowing uh, how successful his little uh, cottage industry business has become. Brand name is, is probably one of the most famous brand names all over the world, uh, like Coca-Cola, Ford, Xerox. It's, it's a trademark easily recognized just about everywhere, not in the United States, but all over the globe. Uh, we print our carton in 19 foreign languages, and we sell to over 100 foreign countries. We, we were before Campbell's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Andy Warhol, actually, Andy Warhol, before he died, wanted to do a, a Tabasco thing, and, 
in our infinite lack of wisdom occasionally, we, uh, we didn't do it. Pace picante sauce, the best-selling salsa in the United States, and possibly the world, has been manufactured since the 1950s. Now owned by Campbell Soup, Pace is the largest corporate user of jalapenos and has helped to introduce many Americans to the joys of eating hot and spicy foods. The fiery foods industry continues to grow at more than 10% a year. In the United States, estimated salsa sales in the year 2000 are $1 billion. Estimated hot sauce sales are a quarter of a billion dollars. Total estimated sales in the fiery foods industry for both food and non-food products are $2.5 billion. <laughs> Most of the consumers of these hot and spicy products are considered to be normal, average human beings. But then there are the chili heads, those semi-addicted cult followers of the pungent pods. And when those chili heads migrate to the Conk Republic of Key West, anything can happen. It was totally appropriate that a chili pepper shrine would be found in Key West, the wackiest city in America. Perhaps the parrot heads would all turn into chili heads. After I arrived in Key West and found a place to stay, I began to search in earnest for the chili pepper shrine. It wasn't with the parrot heads. I looked high. I looked low. Finally, in desperation, I started asking the locals about the shrine. You know, I'm looking for a, some sort of a chili pepper shrine. Do you know anything about that? A friendly vendor directed me to a pedicab driver with the intriguing name of Malagata. Hi there. Hi, how you doing today? Yeah, I'm looking for the chili pepper shrine. Do you suppose we have to be able to find some place? Uh... I tell you what, we can give it a shot. Why don't you hop in? OK, we will do. So began a long afternoon of searching the streets of Key West, and she was charging a dollar a minute, plus a tip. <laughs> the quest for the shrine was getting expensive, but I refused to give up. No shrine at Sloppy Joe's, the famous watering hole of Ernest Hemingway. No shrine along the waterfront. But then Malagata told me that her channeler had just informed her telepathically that she should take me to the mall. Specifically, a small tourist mall that housed yet another hot shop. This one called, logically enough, Peppers of Key West. We're here at Peppers of Key West with Mike Batika. And Mike, uh, you know, I like this chili pepper paraphernalia because I'm wearing a chili pepper shirt, but what is all this stuff? Well, we have chili pepper uh, ashtray, ah. lotion dispenser, salt and pepper shakers. They have an S and a P, so you don't get confused. OK. Cocktail glass. Well, everybody we like needs that. Sure, oh, we you love cocktails your scotch here. that, right? We love cocktails here in Key West. <laughs> Salsa bowl or Salsa. chili bowl. OK, that's a good thing. I see you have some swizzle sticks here. We have some swizzle sticks. Oh, that's handsome. We have little pencils. Chili pepper pencils. Chili Everybody pepper needs pencils. that. Absolutely. And uh, you have the chili pepper lights down here, I see, the chili pepper napkin holder, all this chili pepper paraphernalia, even a clock. We have chili a chili pepper clock for all these chili heads who love the hot sauces that you have in your shop. Now, I've got to tell you that I was sent down here on a mission to find the chili pepper shrine. I've searched all over Florida. I was sent to Key West. You've got to help me. You've got to find the chili pepper shrine. Dave, that's not going to be a problem. You came to the right place. Why don't you meet me at 12 o'clock at the Hogs Breath Saloon? I arrived at the Hogs Breath Saloon at high noon with high expectations. I surveyed the crowd, and everything seemed normal enough. No shrine in sight. Hey, look! But now the customers were beginning to act strangely. But remember, we were in the Conk Republic. And there it was at last. The shrine, the most sacred object to native Florida chili heads. In fact, it was a moving shrine, very moving indeed. The Pepper Mobile.
Well, we found the shrine to Chili's, the holy grail of chili heads, and it turns out to be a Honda. We've also traced the trail of Chili's from seed to salsa. I'm Dave DeWitt, bidding you a fond farewell from Wacky Key West. <laughs>